uh, I want to have some fun with you guys too, because otherwise, the, you know, we, if we just talk stats, it can be the most boring topic in the world. Now, I want to share with you who I am and why I have the right to be up here. I mean, number one, I have a TV show, yip, you know, yippee, big deal. More importantly, the TV show and the radio show I did for about four years gave me the opportunity to meet with and interview some of the top experts in the business. And I'm talking about the chief economists for all of the major banks, some of the biggest developers in, in, in the country, uh, planners. I, I know what's going on from the inside out. Aside from that, I've also been a real estate broker, and that's my, that's my day job. I'm a real estate broker. So uh, that's the contact info. Let's continue. So I asked the question, how, how is the market? Well, let's go through it. A lot of the stats that we're going to see as consumers in the paper, online, you're going to see the market up, market's down. We're going to hear about this on a regular basis. And more often than not, probably 95% of the time, the media is simply reporting on sales volume in the GTA. And if you look at what happens on a regular basis, if you, if you notice that the chart goes down in the winter, it goes down in the summer, and it's up in the spring and the fall, that's just sales volume. That's not value. Okay? And people make, uh, have a problem distinguishing between the two. In the winter, it gets cold, everybody stays home, pretty logical. The spring market comes up, everybody wants to buy. All the first time buyers, which is, you know, let's not forget, the, 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 the first time buyer market is what fuels 95% of the activity in the real estate market. And we're talking about both resales and pre construction here. So when you hear the market is up in uh, May or June, say yes, that's what happens every single year, and the market's up again in the fall. In fact, if you were to hear, and here's what happens. In June, if you look at June on the chart, I don't know if you can see that. June was a, was a whopping month for volume. Can you hear me still? Did I find my, oh, there's back. And then in July, it was dramatically lower. In fact, a few years ago, the Toronto Real Estate Board released their stats as they do every single month, and on the exact same day, based on the exact same stats, the Toronto Star reported that the market was up 12%, and the Globe and Mail reported that the market was down 37%. Is there any wonder why we're confused? And they were both right. What the Globe and Mail was saying was, hey, May is, uh, July is down 37% from June, which is no shocker because that's what happens every single year when everybody goes to the cottage. What the Star was reporting was, hey, uh, July this year is up 12% from July last year, which is probably a more, more, more uh, realistic or more telling measure. So be careful when you're reading the stats. They don't mean really, uh, they don't really mean a lot, especially in the short term. In the long term is what we're looking at. And I don't have the actual chart here, but I can tell you the last 40 years, on an average annual basis, including all the ups and downs, real estate values have gone up, depending on which economist you talk to, anywhere from 7 to 8% per year, every year for the last 40 to 50 years, including the market correction in 81, the market correction in 89. Was anybody around for the market correction in 89, 90? Remember that? That was painful, yeah. It's like a lobotomy while you're having a root canal. Market values went down 25%, but it's easy to see why once you understand. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, anybody heard about the population growth in the GTA? StatScan is telling us 250 to 300,000 people are coming to Canada every single year and they're going to continue to come for the next 10 years and about 40% of them are coming to the GTA. What that means is the GTA is going to grow by 100,000 people which means about 40,000 households, 40,000 families every single year. So in the next 10 to 12 years the GTA will grow by a million people. 400,000 homes. Now when we sell do you think when we sell 80,000 homes a year on the Toronto Real Estate Board market, 40,000 new families this year would have a little bit of an impact? Who thinks there might be an impact? Hold, hold up your hand. Again, the people that don't want to hold up their hands. I know, you're tired. You're walking around with your trades people. I get it. So migration is the one thing I want you to get. This is the driving force for everything that's going on in the GTA. Because people say, well, how long can it go on? It's really simple. It, can go, it will go on as long as we have population growth, as long as our economy is holding firm, as long as rates are low. And when we talk about uh, demand, we also have to talk about supply. So the green belt, a lot of us are familiar with the green belt around the GTA. We can't build in that area. So if you look at the area south of the green belt, it's what I see as what I would call sort of a little real estate island. We've run out of land, right? Is it easy to find a new piece of land in the GTA to build a subdivision on? 
or even an infill, isn't it tough to find even a single lot at, a, at the right price that you can actually build something on? And the reason is the supply is controlled. We're not sure when that will change. It'll probably never change. And the Manhattan effect is really what's come, what's come into play. Now, this is a slide that I dug up about 70 years ago. And it, it's a slide that shows all of the then current buildings that were uh, built. And also a lot of the buildings that were zoned for construction, they were already there. Now when I look at it, it's almost, it's almost all there, isn't it? It's the Manhattan effect. We can't build out, so we have to build up. And by a show of hands, how many think they're, they're building too many condos? Anybody? They're building too many condos? It's going to crash, right? Well, the fact is, we had a record-setting year. Of, you know, we look at the, the first uh, bar on the far left. This is the annual sales for the entire uh, real estate market. And then new condos to market is the second one, 20,000. But what the press doesn't know or doesn't necessarily report is 90% are already pre-sold. In fact, it's a requirement for a builder to have pre-sales before they'll get construction financing. So when you drive down the street and you see a crane on a new high-rise project, the question isn't who's going to buy them. The accurate, the accurate question is who bought them? Because they're already pre-sold. So we have 20,000 new condos coming to market. The unsold suites represent only 2,000 units, and that's about three months of inventory. Now some areas have a little bit more than others. For example, Square One has a little bit of an oversupply, maybe King West, downtown Toronto. But when you look at the harbor front, there's a huge shortage with, with, with zero vacancy rates. When you look at Midtown Toronto, uh, Young and Shepherd might be a little bit more supply. We look at other areas. So, so it's not just the overall market you need to understand. You need to understand you know, the little micro markets. And again, the annual population growth. We've got 2,000 new units coming to market today and 40,000 new families coming to Pearson this year. Are we building, who still thinks we're building too many condos? Right, we're not building enough. In fact, they're predicting that within four to five years, we're going to have a shortage and there's gonna be a dramatic spike in values in certain areas that have good supply. Now, let me give you a little bit of a context. Condos in Toronto for prime downtown product is anywhere from 500 to let's say $700 a foot. Does that sound right? How many think that's high? <clears throat> okay. In Manhattan, if you want to buy a new condo right now, it's six to eight thousand dollars per square foot. How many think five hundred dollars in Toronto is high now? Right? And, and here's the thing, it's not just price. When you evaluate a marketplace and you want to say what's high, what's low, hey, a two million dollar starter home in downtown Toronto is kind of part for the course, right? If you if you find if you're lucky to find a bungalow on a buildable lot, uh, you put up a decent twenty five hundred square foot home. You're in the 2 million or 2.5 range depending on the neighborhood, right? This is, this is your world, right? Now, when we look at that, we look at how many, how many are selling. Well, they come up and they're multiple offers and they're selling 100,000. So are we building enough or are we building not enough? There's, there's not enough. There's still a shortage in supply. People also talk about affordability. The banks, as everyone in this room knows, will qualify you before they give you a mortgage. And they base it on your down payment, your purchase price, and your income. The affordability mark, what the banks use is called the TDS, which is Total Debt Service. And it's especially difficult on self-employed people like everybody in this room, right? I'm self-employed as well. I know, that, I know how that works. So they're even tougher on us. And thanks to Mr. Harper and, and the federal uh, guidelines for banking the last few years, the banking structure in Canada is so conservative. We're the only company in the world that's had, that really survived the, the market crash over the last few years. Anybody ever thought about that? Asia's a mess, Europe is a mess, the US, we all know what happened down there, and yet Canada is shielded. We have such a conservative banking system, and it's served us well. And here, here's what I know, because I've, I've been doing this in Canada, I'm speaking in the US. The difference between Canadians and Americans is Canadians are, write it down, conservative, chicken, and cheap. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? And it's served us well. If, if Canadians don't know what to do, they don't have clear indication on what to do, they're going to do nothing. They're just going to sit tight and wait to see what happens. It happened a few years ago with the market correction. So the affordability mark that the bank uses is 40%. We've always been well below it, except if you look on the far left, this is what happened in 1989, 88, 89, 90. We went way beyond the affordability. People were coming in, a lot of international investors, especially from Hong Kong at the time, were coming into the Toronto area and buying up everything for cash. So bank affordability had nothing to do with it. So the market ran away from itself. And then what did we see right after that? We saw a market correction down to normal. So we always, these are some of the things that we look at. 
So will the market crash? Well, the market will crash if people are spending beyond what they can afford and they're not. We're still below the affordability indicator used by the banks. Mortgage rates. Um, how many have noticed that they keep threatening to raise rates and never do? Right? And, and Bank of Canada, again, said the overnight rate's not, not moving. You can get a five-year mortgage for two and a half. You can get a variable rate mortgage for less than that. You can lock in a 10-year mortgage for three and a half percent. And I can't predict the future, but I can tell you that every single one of the economists that we interview says the same thing. There's no indication that there's any way the banks can raise rates in the short term. So we're going to be, we're going to be living with these rates for a little while. And for the next two, three years, there's not going to be very much uh, of a rate increase, if anything. Okay? Employment rate. The unemployment rate has steadily come down since 2009, since the market crash, come down to normal levels. We're below 8%, and that's sort of the normal range. And this is, this is one of the indicators for why rates can't go up. Uh, we look at the sales activity. Volume is a good indicator. Volume is up a little bit. Uh, the average selling price is up a little bit. Uh, you know, we look at the stats, there's another interesting thing, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this. About 60 to 70 percent of homes are selling in any, in any given market, which means there's still 20 to 30 percent that are um, overvalued and not selling. Look at the average uh, SP to LP, that's sale price to list price, second from the right. Homes are selling quickly, and they're selling at just below 100 percent or just above 100 percent of value. What that indicates, again, confirming supply is short, the demand is there, and it's a solid market. But you still, in this market, even in this market, you still can't just overprice homes. We're still seeing some uh, aggressive sellers, and you've seen it out there. House is worth, the, the lot where the house is worth 700 750 they're listing it for eight ninety nine and hoping to get multiple offers and get even more. Well, the market is very savvy right now. The buyers know what the values are, and we have more access uh, to information than, than ever before. Okay. What's the forecast for sales? Well, the forecast for sales, obviously, the volume is going to be going up with the population growth and the price forecast again. But we often talk about the average sale price. And what I want to, what I want to point out is a, a more telling measure, and you may want to write this down because I don't have a slide on this, but write down house price index. You get a cookie if you write it down. House price index. House price index is the measure that actually looks at real values versus average values. And I'll give you a bit of an example. Uh, anybody heard of the Bridal Path neighborhood? Ever heard of it? Multi-million dollar homes. I mean, an entry level lot in there is five to ten million dollars. Uh, there are twenty million dollar homes very commonly. Okay, solid neighborhood. Well, we always reported on uh, we always report on average price of sales based on a district or an area. So we look at, you know, central Toronto, that's one of the districts, one of the central districts. But just on the outskirts, uh, who knows the Canadian Tire on Shepherd and Leslie? Can you picture that location? Pretty busy location. And then all the condos that they started building uh, just south of Shepherd along that area. Concord Adex is a big developer, as we all know. They started putting up all these condos. Well, those condos fall into that neighborhood, that central district. So all of a sudden, when you never had any condo selling in this neighborhood under multi-million dollars, all of a sudden you went from five million dollar sales in, the, in that central district to three and four hundred thousand dollar condos being sold in the same district. Guess what happened to the average sale price for real estate in that district? It dropped seventy-five percent. Now, does that mean that the guy with the house on the bridal path lost seventy-five percent of his home value? No, it just means the average price of what's selling. So you've got to learn to read into the stats a little bit. The house price index is a much better anal uh, analysis tool because it looks at, it'll actually take specific homes that sold twice or more in a five year period and say what did that house go up in value and what did that townhouse go up in value, what did that condo go up in value for, and then it tells you what's the real market value measure, okay? So, uh, we, talk, uh, we talk about the market condition. Was that helpful so far? Yes? Okay. Any questions about that? Because I know we have a little, little more time before we go to lunch. Any questions at all? Yes? The, you, you used the example of a house that gets sold three, three or four times in five years. Yeah. Those are probably pretty lousy houses. They have to be sold that often. No, they have to be sold at least twice in a five-year period. How many houses get really sold 
twice in five years. Well, there, there's actually a lot. You, 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 yeah, there, there actually is enough to, to, to justify what's going on in a neighborhood. And if there are areas where they're only selling, let's say, in 10 years, then they'll work on those as well. But, what, but the distinction is, they're looking at actual specific properties that are selling at least twice or more in a given period of time. But yeah, I mean, the end user product, if you go into executive homes uh, where people are typically staying 10, 15, or 20 years, yeah, they're tougher to find in those areas. But even in those areas, you're going to get people that are moving, they, they got a job transfer. Uh, anybody heard of divorce? There's divorce. Yeah, so, so we get a lot, you'd be surprised. And uh, turnover in most neighborhoods is probably around three, four percent. But the point is this: we're not just looking at like uh, we're not just looking at an aggregate of the average sale price. We're looking at actual increase in values, and that is more important a measure for what's going on in the marketplace uh, than average price. Is that fair? The three hundred thousand you paid the committee to you're saying you're going to the metro area are those combined condos? Great question. Yeah, so here's, here's what, we, what we see. About 25 to 30 percent are buying homes or condos within the first two years. The other 75 percent are renting. And in both cases, they're driving demand for housing. And they're renting houses, they're renting condos. And we still have, here, I mean, you have to understand that we're looking at a lot of different measures at the same time, right? Of all these people coming in. And who can picture, for example, the older purpose-built rental high-rise building? They're typically 20 stories, they're usually pretty ugly, the balconies are rusty, uh, and they're owned by a pension fund or a REIT, and, and they're, they're sprinkled all over the transit system. You know what I'm talking about, guys? So, so because the economics of the market don't justify anybody building rental stock, builders are only building condos, they're, they're, they're getting the land, they can either build rental and make a dollar, or they can build a condo, sell it and make three dollars, well guess what they're doing? So what's happened now in most markets is because of the increased demand for rental, all of a sudden individual investors are buying individual condos and using them as rental properties. And also, we're obviously, we're seeing increased demand on bungalows and side splits and basement apartments. Anybody have an income property by, by, just by show of hands in the room? So you're in the business too. And you're in the business because the ROI on your investment is fantastic. In fact, uh, what we're seeing because of the power of leverage, we'll talk about that in a second, is that if you're a landlord right now, you're making 25 to 35% annually on your money. How many think that's a decent return, say I? Right? How many are skeptical about the idea, thought about doing a rental, but maybe skeptical about it? Special hands. Okay, so what's your name? <coughs> Mike. What are you nervous about? You need capital. Well, that's, that's the first stumbling block. But let's say you got a stumbling block. Let's say you got the capital, got that stumbling block out of the way. Now, I'm going to partner with you. We're going to do a joint venture. I'll put up the capital. You do the rental and manage it. That's very common. We see that all the time. Deal? Okay, we'll find you a partner. But aside from that, who has the capital but has been nervous about the idea? Like, what do we typically hear? What are the horror stories about income properties? What's that? The rental tribunal. Okay, dealing with bad tenants. What else? What else? What can go wrong with income properties? Repairs? Not getting, not getting financing? Right? Uh, vacancy rates, the tenant from hell, all that stuff. Well, aside from that, what we're finding is this. Well, just to answer your question about you know being nervous about the tribunal, who knows what I'm talking about when I say the, the right way to avoid bad tenants is never never put them in your place. Do the proper scrutiny up front, and, we, and 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 I'll tell you, we we've been we we own properties and we manage properties for a lot of clients. We literally have done thousands over the years. And what we found in almost every single case is anytime we had that tenant from hell, you know the professional tenant that knows the system, will mess with you, will give you partial checks, then avoid your calls, and then show up with a cast at the tribunal, and you know, all of these different things. Well, here's what we discovered. Those bad tenants were not properly screened to begin with. There's a whole, I can do a seminar on that, and that's another topic altogether. Uh, but what we found is this. It's a good viable business, and the, per the percentage of problems that we see when you do it correctly, when you A, buy the right property, B, tenant it correctly, three, manage it correctly, because I know a lot of landlords that think the tenants are, are they're doing the tenants a favor. No, they're doing you a favor. I've got a, a, just as an example, I've got a basement tenant in one of my properties that pays me $1,200 a month. Over the course of five 
years, that $75,000 that this little lady is giving me, $75,000. How nice would you be to me, Mike, if I gave you 75,000 bucks? How nice should you be to me? So, you know, we actually encourage our investor clients to show up at Christmas with a bottle of wine if they like, if they've got kids, bring a teddy bear. So be nice. Think about the, from a customer service standpoint, you're in the business of landlording and your customers are tenants. So that's a different mindset. And we can do another seminar on that. But let's talk about, you know, what we, when we talk to consumers, because this is what their questions are, uh, what makes a good investment property? Because the question always comes up, what's the best type? And why is real estate so strong? Well, let's look at how money is made in real estate, because I think people forget that. If the market goes up this year 10%, how much money have you made on your investment? Not sure. Mike, how much, have, how much have you made? 10%? Okay, well that's, that's the common thought. But let's really dive in. If you've got money, there's a couple of other things at play that change that. And on average what we're seeing is if you're getting a 10% increase in the market, your, your return on investment, because of a very powerful thing called leverage, is closer to 40%. Because, let's stick with Mike, because I know your name. So you buy a $500,000 property. Okay? How much money would you invest if you put 20% down? Yeah, 20% is 100 grand. Okay? So the market goes up 10% in value. How much in value has it gone up? $50,000. How much did you invest? How much did you make? 50. What's your return on investment? 50%. There's a couple of other variables at play here, but that's just one indication. And leverage is the most powerful thing. And the leverage is one of them, but let me, let, me, let me not steal my thunder from the rest of the slides I have, so let me continue with my checklist here. Appreciation is obviously one of them. So let's go back and say, let's say the market didn't do nearly as well, Mike. It only went up 3%. So the market went up 3%. What's three times five? Because you invested 20%. This is a five-time leverage, right? You made 15%. How many would be happy with a consistent 15% return on your investment for the life for the rest of your life? Because who, who like me got their ass handed to them, got their ass kicked by the stock market ever? RSP, stock market, and, and, and a lot of people are sick and tired of that because of the volatility in the stock market. It can go up dramatically, and it can actually go down dramatically. Now, for example, when we look at real estate investment trusts, that's sort of a, a a compilation investment that invests in a lot of different things. We've seen real estate investment trusts go up in value by as much as 25% in one year. We've also seen them go down as much as 30% in one year. Anybody heard of Warren Buffett? Anybody heard of Warren Buffett? Yes? What's rule number one for Warren is don't lose your money. Who think that's a good rule? Don't lose your money. So one, invest in a solid location, and you know we've heard location, location, location. So appreciation is the one, okay? Principal recapture. When we buy an income property, we don't pay cash. We have a mortgage. And as we pay the mortgage over time, what happens? The principal is paid down. So we're recapturing that principal. And that's a big component. And what's happening over time? What happens to rents over time? Do they go up or down? They go up. Have they ever gone down consistently? Never. They always go up. And the ironic thing is, if the market were to go to hell in a handbasket, what would happen to the rental market is more people would start renting and rents would go up. So the return on income properties would be even higher. So this is, this is one of the, the mechanisms that we've recognized. So obviously, we've got a principal recapture without going into amortization tables. When you start, you typically have, for example, a 25-year amortization table, yes or yes? Right. Now what happens over rents over 10 years is they typically double every 10 years. That's just what they do. So if rents are doubling on a regular basis, what we see typically is that you can actually pay off a 25 year mortgage in about 10 years. How many think that's a good place to make money? Let's say you pay off your $400,000 mortgage, Mike, in 10 years. That $400,000 is not taxable because that's just debt that you repaid. Okay, that's aside from the property value going from $500,000 to a million dollars over 10 years. Okay, so principal recapture. And we talked about rent increases. And of course, we have the regular market influence. We also have, you know, we're limited when we have an existing tenant. But the tenant moves out, you clean up the place, you are increasing rents. We also have what a lot of you know intimately, and that is you find a piece of property, you add value. You buy a property for 100,000, you put 20,000 in renovations, and the property's now worth 140. You've created a new value of $20,000.
So a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the investors we're working with, a lot of the contractor investors we're working with, are buying dilapidated properties, cleaning them up. Now the question becomes, how do you do an economical upgrade? Right? I mean, I've seen people spend way too much money on a basement kitchen, where they should be, you know, something kitchen out of a box in the basement, because that's what the tenant would require, rather than putting in what they're, you know, what, what somebody thinks is a, is a better looking kitchen than this or that. So you have to look at the economics. So we have adding value. And of course, the, the huge tax advantages. See, if I never sell a property, if I buy a property with Mike and we do well, and 10 years from now, the value is a million dollars. And it sounds weird, but that's what's going to happen. It's going to double in value every five to five to seven years on average. But let's say it's 10 years, it's gone up in value to a million dollars, and it's actually, we've paid off the mortgage. We wouldn't actually do that, but let's say we paid off the mortgage. We've made a million dollars in 10 years, and if we don't sell that property, how much in capital gains tax will we pay? Zero. How many like paying zero tax legally? <laughs> legally. Right? Remember I said legally? So then the other side of it is managing income. So you have your rent, and then you have your mortgage and taxes and all of that other stuff. And one of the balances is understanding how to balance that loan to value so that you neutralize most of the income. Because 10 years from now, Mike and I are gonna have a party. That's one thing, because we just made a million bucks. And we can sell a property and get that money and pay tax on it, right? Mike, what's another way we can get that money? Out. We can leverage it. We can take out a mortgage for $800,000, We've just borrowed 800, and what are Mike and I going to do now? Well, first go to Vegas, maybe, but after that, we're going to buy four more properties, aren't we, Mike? We're going to leverage it. And this is the basic building block of what a lot of investors are doing in our market, and it's a huge tax advantage, because now we've just created another write-off, we've liberated that cash, and we're, we're, you know, we call it flipping to ourselves. And we're going to recycle the down payment. We're going to reuse the equity. We're, we're going to buy four more properties. And then five years from now, now we're managing five properties. We're making a million on one. Wouldn't it be better to make five million on five? Understanding the business. But you got to know it as a business. You have to understand it from beginning to end. Any questions on any of this stuff so far? Don't. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Well, you have a question or are you stretching? Well, why are, why are the banks so hard to get? That's a great question. Why are the banks uh, giving us such a hard time? Well, first of all, uh, you should know that there are 400 lenders in the country and there are five banks. So maybe there's other lenders that are friendlier to self-employed people like you and me. Because I'm self-employed too, right? All of our stuff is, is considered T4A rather than T4. So we always have a hard time. We have to have a different down payment. And if you walk into the bank, you're gonna bump into Jimmy with a nice little you know suit and tie who's got absolutely no experience. And all Jimmy has for you is that bank's product line. And he's taught that if they're not, uh, he's taught that if you're if the person in front of you is not self is if not a salaried employee with a T4 with their 15% down and, and you know husband and wife with a little dog, it doesn't fit into their little qualification circle. So it spits out. And then they maybe don't call you back or they tell you we can't help you, sir. Right? But there are a lot of lenders that are happy to work with self-employed people, they understand. Uh, they know what gross income is and they know what net income is. Uh, they look at other things like what's your down payment or what are your other assets and what's your history to pay. So if, you're, if you've got solid credit and you've been, you know, if you've been in the business um, for a long time and you've demonstrated that you're a real professional, because let's face it, this industry is just like my industry, the real estate industry, is full of very professional, very competent people and a lot of less than professional, less than competent people. How many would agree that your industry is the exact same thing right now? It's part of the problem. Right? So it's, it's learning how to differentiate yourself in your market. And I think one of the things is understanding, well, hey, you know what? We need to do, go to different lenders. Sometimes, who's ever had to deal with construction financing for a client? Anybody have to deal with that? Yeah, and it's, it's sometimes it's a, tr it's a problem depending on the client. But well, we have resources, and we can certainly point you, you need a referral. We've got a lot of good mortgage brokers that specialize in working with independent contractors, that specialize in doing construction financing. Uh, make sure you get our email, just ask for that. Um, no pressure, we don't spam anybody. You need info, we just send it out. You need to build your advisory team. You need to have the finance people that know what they're doing. You need to have the realtors that know the local market. You need to have that arsenal, and you need to educate yourself on what your consumers are thinking, and what they know, and what their real objectives are. Does that make sense? Okay. So any other questions about that one? Was there another?
another one? Shall I continue? Yes, my friend. You mentioned about the 400 uh, lenders and five major banks. The major banks, you said, you know, for instance, the 10-year mortgage to have a 3% or 2.5%. Do the other 400 lenders, are they paying kind of the rate you paying premium? Sometimes they're competitive and sometimes you're paying more. But here's the thing. Uh, I'd rather get financing than not get financing. Right? Now when I say sometimes you're paying more, sometimes you might just paying 20 basis points more, 25 basis points more. In, in, the, in the end, it really is a function of what we're doing. Because look, we're independent contractors for a reason. Uh, we're independent contractors because of the tax advantages. So we get a little bit of a benefit on that side of things. Uh, we've got to have a little bit of a payment on this side. And don't forget, if, it, if we're paying an extra 20 basis points on financing, that's an additional write-off. So it's not that big a deal. Because it's the interest it's the interest that we write off when we're talking about income properties or when we're talking about a rental project or, or a brand new build. So you got to kind of have to take the good with the bad. And you also have to be realistic. Because if you're holding out for consumer terms on a commercial investment or on a, or, or on a, a rental property, then that's not realistic either. So the best thing is to work with, see here's the thing too. Everybody repeat after me. Google is not my research department. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? Hey, there's a lot of good stuff on Google and YouTube and all of that. I, I learned how to do an ice rink in my backyard for the kids. But in our, in, if, you, if you search, Google, if you Google mortgage rates, you're going to get a million ads, you're going to get a million pop-ups. You really have no idea what makes sense. And there's a lot of teaser ads out there, yes or yes. Right? So what you need is a professional that knows, hey, listen, I've got a self-employed person. Uh, I, these guys can look at your rate, they can look at your file, they can look at your app, and they say, you know what, we've got a good fit with lender B, here's the rates, and then they can stick handle the paperwork to get that financing handled for you. How many, makes, how many think that makes sense? We need to focus on our core business. I've been doing this for 30 years, I still leave the financing to my mortgage guys. I still leave uh, law to my lawyer. I still leave contracting work to you guys. I have an Italian last name, but I can't turn a screw. So I leave that to you guys. Focus on your core competence and let, let the professionals handle some of the other stuff, right? Just like, you know, just like anything else. So let's continue. And I know you guys are getting hungry, so I'm going to wrap up soon. Uh, leverage, we talked about that. You're typically not paying cash, so the leverage is in understanding how to leverage a rental project, how to leverage a purchase, how to leverage a, a construct, major construction project, and, and leverage could include bringing in outside investors, okay? So what's next? Um, one of the things we do for people, and, and I think you could also maybe take a little bit of this approach with your clients, is look at what we do and maybe mirror that a little bit. Uh, we, we sit down with somebody and whether they're buying their first home or they're getting into an investment project like a buy a, a rental, buy, buy a property for rental, or they're looking at much something more complicated, acquiring uh, an old bungalow, doing a teardown and a new build, we go through the whole process from beginning to end. So we do a portfolio analysis, we give them uh, a review of what's going on in the marketplace, we develop a long-term plan, uh, and, and again, building a team of experts is important, and then of course helping with execution. How many have had plans to do something but never pulled the trigger? Anybody? Anybody plan to lose weight like I do every January 1st and it just fails miserably after a couple of weeks? Right. So we, we, we partner with people to help with execution. We're not here to sell you anything, but um, the only plug I'll, I'll, I'll say is this. Uh, was, was it worth your time attending today? Was this helpful? I show hands. Be great. So if you want to make sure, actually at the desk here, if you'd like a copy of the PDF of all the information I gave out today, just grab one of these cards and fill that out, leave it on the table. Tyler, say hi to everybody. Tyler will pick them up. Everybody say thank you, Tyler, for pulling them out. Thank you. Good job. Okay, we've also got um, audio CDs. There were some. Uh, if, you, if, they, if they're all gone and you want one, it's an audio CD with a little bit more information than we did in the, we actually recorded that at the radio station on what's going on in the marketplace. Anyone have one visible? You can hold it up for me so people can see. If you didn't get one, let me know and we'll mail, we'll mail out a copy or we'll, we'll send you a SoundCloud link. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.